Please remain standing as we read God's Word together. We are in Matthew 16. And today we are looking at verses 16 through 18. Uh, verses we've already covered, but uh, we're going to be we're going to be hanging out here for a while. Verses 16 through 18. Simon Peter answered, "You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God." And Jesus said to him, "Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you." That you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that your Holy Spirit is preaching to all of our hearts as we look at the importance of your word and the importance of the truth that we will be going over today. I pray that you make this truth known to us. You bring us all to great conviction. And, Lord, that we are better today and renewed today through the reading and worshiping of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Mankind is created in the image of God. And like we have stated before and how we studied before, all mankind knows the truth of God. They know the truth, but they have suppressed that truth in unrighteousness. They've exchanged the truth for a lie, and that's Romans 1. This is true of everybody everywhere at all times. They know the truth. The truth is evident within them. The attributes of God is displayed before us in creation. The truth is around us all the time. In many ways, mankind displays that this truth is evident within them when they display their desire of worship. Every single human being has a desire to worship. Not only do they have a desire to worship, but they have a desire to gather and worship. This is true of every single human being. The atheists believe in their ignorance that they have no belief in a deity and they worship nothing. They worship absolutely nothing. But they are delusional in their thinking when they think in such a way and behave in such a way. I tell you, the number one thing that I see in common with uh, these uh, really famous hardcore atheists that have really big platforms, the number one thing I see in common with them is a hyper and intense amount of sexual depravity. Every single one of them. Known for it. It's no secret. They actually have a reputation for it. They're open and proud about this depravity. And that is something that has become an object of worship for them. And matter of fact, this whole month, this whole pride month that you're seeing and how these companies are celebrating and these people are celebrating is is a display of of that same type of depravity and their act of worship uh, for this, this depraved act. That's what it is. They are coming together, they are gathering, and it's an act of worship. As a matter of fact, it's, that, it's the, these very acts, these very things that they worship that actually cause them to live these lifestyles and encourage, in, encourage them in their blasphemy. Because they worship it. They love it so much that they worship it, and it's actually the source of their blasphemy. They blaspheme God, they deny God, they deny the existence of God, because that is the way they can continue doing what they are doing without the hindrance of guilt. This is why they hate God's people. God's people are a reminder of their guilt. And so they hate God's people as well. As far as the atheists go, they gather, they come together, they have, they have actual meetings and organizations, they gather and they discuss on how oh so smart they are and just how stupid we are for having a faith. I mean, that's what they do. They go and gather and pat each other's on the back. We're so great, we're so smart, and they're so dumb. They have their own gatherings. They are compelled to gather together and yet do not know why they have this this sensation of wanting to gather. You have cults 
like the Mormons and like the Jehovah's Witness who gather together, very much believe that they are a church, and they gather together and they practice a worship of a false god. You have non-believers who, who really don't think one way of another when it comes to spiritual things or religious things, but uh, perhaps they are, are a, a diehard fan of a certain type of comic book or movie or something like that. You know, in my, in my mind, when I think of fandom and everything, I really think about Star Wars and the fandom behind Star Wars. And you see how some people behave when it comes to Star Wars. As a matter of fact, they have a word when they talk about the plot of Star Wars. They use the word canon, the same word we use. When we talk about scripture. And so they go, this is canon. This plot is canon. When it comes to certain plot lines within the Star Wars universe. I've seen videos of people who were full on bawling in tears. At watching the movie trailer for one of the Star Wars movies. They actually filmed their reactions and they were full on bawling watching this. And they have their gatherings, and they have their get-togethers. And it, this is something that happens annually. They do it every year. And when a new movie drops, they get a bunch of people together. They go and see it together. It's this great community of people coming together and doing this. Now they got Star Wars on streaming. They got TV shows, and people are actually organizing these big parties to watch them take place, gather together. If you enjoy the movies, fine. That's not what this is about. We're talking about an attitude of worship that is super evident when it comes to this specific situation. There are people within that fandom who display an act of worship when it comes to this specific fake universe. You have sports fans who will have diehard obsession of these sports. And this is the particular thorn in our sides because so many of these people are professing believers. But watch how many of them on Sunday will gladly give God the finger. They will gladly give God the finger and say, you, without hesitation, you know what? I just can't come and gather this entire season because I got something, going, something else going on uh, on this Sunday, and I'm going to stare at the screen instead. They profess to know God, but they do not know God one iota. And when it comes time for them to really take a strong stand, like they're in a situation where now it comes to make this great defense and everything that you should know as a believer is pivotal right here at this moment. They are clueless. They don't know how to argue the truth of Scripture. But they'll know the statistics of Tom Brady. When it comes time to defend their quarterback, they know that stuff. Some of these people will know the batting average of Mark McGuire just so they can inform you that he's one of the greatest hitters. Now, I'm really dating myself with these references. Uh, if you listen to the name drops that I'm doing, I'm sorry. I do not have any knowledge of modern day baseball or of who's the, the best quarterback at the moment, the, the, the rising quarterback right now. I have zero knowledge of this stuff. So, so my references are a bit dated. I get it. The point is that you're diehard sports fans. Enjoy gathering with others to watch this sport. Now listen to, to my point carefully. My point is not sports are bad or movies are bad. That's not the point I'm trying to make here. My point is that there is an attitude that is present, that there is this desire for mankind to want to gather together and worship. And when they're not doing this with God's people and when they're not doing this for God, they will display it somewhere else. You cannot avoid how, the, the, how you were created. You just cannot avoid it. You will do it to something. And we would be plain delusional if we do not call some of these actions an act of worship. Because they most certainly are. And then on top of that, you have faithful and active churchgoers who attend churches that, frankly, should not have that title, church. They're there every Sunday. They enjoy every message. But what they don't know is that they're sitting in a place that should not be called a church. And by the end of this study, and I'm not talking about today, I'm talking about the next few Sundays, I'll explain why that is. 
I mean, if we were to look at all of the scriptures and ask ourselves, what makes the church a church, which we plan on doing here, and we make the solid declaration of here's what the scriptures say, this is what the church is, and we agree, yes, this is what the scriptures have to say, this is what defines a church, then I will have no hesitation whatsoever to say that Elevation Church, the church that Stephen Furtick pastors, should not be called Elevation Church, but Elevation Country Club. They are not a church. And this is true of many who are like that. They are not churches. And then if you look at some of these real hyper-independent fundamental Baptist church uh, uh, traditions, especially like in the Bible Belt area, some of these guys are so lost in their tradition that it has caused them to be irrational, unreasonable, and delusional to the point where if you were to ask those, if you were to take those same standards where we judged Elevation Church with and apply it to these guys as well, the same standards, the same definition, then we cannot call those places churches as well. They are a type of social gathering. But if when we look at the truth of Scripture, we cannot, with integrity and truth, we cannot call these places churches. If you look at the type of people and the type of situation that I have in mind, the somebody I, I would point you to is somebody named Steve Anderson, who's... Uh, has a ministry out in uh, Arizona. Uh, I believe there might be some circulated YouTube videos with him, but this guy, this guy has probably been kicked off just about every single social media site and every single, uh, just about everything that uh, uh, that's popular or mainstream right now. He's been kicked off of it. Uh, he he thrives on controversy. His whole mo is let's see how controversial I can be. He's been kicked off just about every platform. And this is just a social gathering of people who are angry. That's it. That's, what he, that's the people he gathered together are other angry people. He's an angry man, and, uh, and, and they're just a gathering of angry people. And I believe the man is very much angry about what the things that he preaches about, but when he goes to preach about them, he puts on a display, he puts on a show. And it becomes a form of entertainment. And he enjoys the attention. He does these things that I don't even know what right person in their mind would do in the pulpit. But when he does them, he gets laughs, he gets cheers, he gets, hey man, because that's how they say it in these churches like that. He gets those and he loves the attention. I mean, he's done things that are just flat out obnoxious. And you can tell he's trying to be funny and entertaining. He's an entertainer. And these ministries... To one extreme and to the other, we got the Elevation Church and then we got the Steve Anderson Church, are gathering people by the hundreds, if not thousands. Whether it's atheism in practicing of their little depraved acts, whether it's the obsession with sports or the obsession of a movie or a comic book character or comic books in general, um, or, or obsession with many movies, whether it's the gathering of false religions like the Jehovah's Witness or the Mormons, if it's the gathering of the super left and soft ministry or the extremely conservative independent fundamentalist baptist gathering the point is that i'm trying to make in general is that mankind was made to worship and that is something that cannot be avoided within us we will worship some, something we will find ways to gather for that very specific cause and we will worship and if the worship is not properly being directed at god and there's a reasonable response for the work of God in you, then the worship within us does not stop. It just goes towards something else. Mankind, every single person, has a desire to worship. And so when we look at mankind, what we have to look at is that all of mankind, whether we want to call it in our... what. In our modern day language, we would probably call it spiritual people. 
the claim is that I'm trying to make everybody is a spiritual person in a sense, to use modern language. Even when they claim they do not have it, it is on display that that's exactly who they are. And when we consider all of this spiritual language that is in our modern day culture, culture like all the, the symbols and the buildings and the books and the teachings and everything that, that is connected spiritually in a way, when we consider all the things spiritual, whether it's false or just a secular concept in general of spirituality, there is probably no other thing on this earth more abused than the church herself. It is my opinion that when we consider everything that the world considers spiritual, there is nothing on this earth more abused than the church herself. For many, it's probably a topic we could care less about. And if you don't think that is true, just think about what I said last week. Walk into any Christian bookstore. Walk into any Christian bookstore. And I challenge you to find a book, a solid book on church teaching. The chances are you're not going to find it. I challenge you to find a solid book on church history in any Christian bookstore. If you find one, you will be lucky. And if you do find one, chances are it's going to teach falsely about the church. And what it's really going to do is push emotionalism and sensationalism. But you will not get the fundamental doctrines of the truth out of Scripture in some of those books that will be sold there. I actually challenge you to go and find it. You will not. The books that you will find in there will lack biblical truth of what the church is and what the church isn't. It is my belief that the church is one of the greatest gifts that God has given his people, and at the exact same time, I believe it's one of the most abused gifts, if not the most abused gift that God has given. So last week kind of served as an introduction. Now we're going to start slowly unpacking these things. So let's continue our study as we, spe uh, as we focus specifically on on the church. Look at what Jesus says again. Let's reread 16 through 18, verses 16 through 18 out of Matthew 16. Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, This is key to understanding, by the way, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now, we are including verses 16 and 17 uh, for the sake of context, but our main focus is actually on verse 18. But as a way of reminder, we see Peter made this great declaration. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is more than just, I believe that you're the Messiah. It's way more than that. He's making a declaration, I believe that you are divine. I don't just believe you're the Messiah, the one to come, but I also believe you are divine. And Jesus told him that he was blessed because his declaration of faith, that statement he just made, was not something that he was persuaded by man to make that statement. You did not come to this conclusion by flesh and blood, meaning no man has caused you to come to this conclusion. So no, no man encouraged him to come to this conclusion, nor did he come to this conclusion himself, because Peter is also flesh and blood. Peter did not say, as we say in our culture today, he did not make this decision for Christ. That would mean it was revealed by flesh and blood. Rather, our Lord informs Peter that this was a revelation, that this was revealed, this was something revealed to Peter by the Father who is in heaven. You confess this truth and you know this truth because God made it known to you. It's a miracle. It's divine. It's beautiful. That was what we're seeing here. And so the context of verse 18 is connected with verses 16 and 17. It is not only the truth of what Peter says, but it's also, also the truth of what Jesus has to say right here. That this confession, this confession that we are united together on, this very confession that Christ will build his church 
is not something that is done by flesh and blood, but it's done by the work of God. And so Jesus tells Simon, you are Peter, which means stone, and upon this rock I will build my church. And last week we looked at the language. He's using different language here. He does not say, you are Peter, and on you, Peter, I will build this church, but rather you are the rock using one Greek word, and then I will, and upon this rock using a different word, I will build my church. And this is kind of where we have our area of focus. I will build my church. Now, this is the first time in the New Testament that we see this word, church. Now, at this point, you will hear many preachers, when they come up upon this text, and they preach out of this text, they will say, what is the church? And they will say, the church is the gathering of the people, but it's not the building. It's the people, not the building. And we hear that all the time. And they'll explain it in a very quick fashion. They'll just kind of say, just so you know, the church is not the building, it's the people, and then they kind of move on. We will not be doing that. Because that would be bearing false witness. It's not a direct lie. It's not a lying statement, but it's not the whole truth. And if you're not telling the whole truth, then you bear false witness. Imagine being questioned in the court of law. And you're called to take a stand and testify. And you're being, you're being questioned. You, you, you swore under oath to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Let's say you witnessed your best friend murder somebody. You actually watched them commit the act. You've seen it. And you were on the stand and you were being questioned. And you weren't directly lying, but you weren't telling the whole truth. You didn't want to tell the whole truth, but you're, 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 you're not directly lying either. And so imagine that, that this, this, uh, this attorney's pestering you and you're on trial and they say, did you see your friend that night? And you say, yeah, I, I seen him. I, I seen him that night. Okay, did you see him murder somebody? And you just keep saying, you keep refusing to actually answer that question. You just keep repeating, yeah, I seen him that night. I seen him that night. Yes, but did you see that person kill somebody? I just seen him, okay? I seen him that night. That's all I'm saying. I seen him that night. And you just keep repeating that and repeating that. Now, you, at this point, you may be convincing yourself, well, I'm not lying. I'm just not giving them all that they want. But in the court of law, that would be called perjury. Because you're bearing false witness. You're not telling the whole truth. Well, if I give you all the cheap explanation of the church, that would be a form of perjury. I would not be benefiting you all. I would be bearing false witness. So here's the first note that we must take when it comes to the church. The church is so much more than just some cheesy profession that we've memorized over the years. So much more. And if you're content with that simple definition, then we should repent. And so our Lord says, upon this rock, I, I will build my church. And again, this is the first time we see the word church in the New Testament. The Greek word is ekklesia. That's what's used here. This is where you get the word ecclesiology. Last week I said remember that word. Because you may hear it often. You're going to hear it often from this pulpit. But you may, if you, if you find a book that gives a serious study of the church, you're going to see that word a lot. And that's what it means. It means the study of the church. The word ecclesia means the assembly, the gathering. This is not a word that is used by our Lord for just any gathering. He does not use this word to describe just any gathering. But it's a gathering of his people. I will build my ecclesia. I will build my gathering, my people. And that is the first mark of the church, that they are the people of Christ. Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church. You see, folks, 
When we're faithful with the gospel message, we do what is often called planting the gospel seeds. You know, we plant that seed in somebody. And then some will come and do the same thing. And in some circles, we would say they, they came and watered those seeds. And so in some Christian circles, you hear people say, you know, we got planters and we got those who water. But only God causes the increase of the crop. Do you understand that this is the truth of church growth? It is not by the activities of man. It is God who brings the increase. Keep that in mind, that order that we see in these verses. Keep this in mind. We see that there's a profession that Peter made. And the profession he made was not revealed to him by flesh and blood. It is something divine. It is from God himself. And our Lord says it is upon that confession of faith, upon that faith, Christ himself will build the church. The church is Christ built. Therefore, it is Christ owned. The true church are only those who belong to Christ. In fact, the word church itself comes from a Dutch word, which came from a German word, which came from a medieval Greek word, which came from an ancient Greek word. Okay? That's how language works, by the way. It just keeps going down. Kirikon is that Greek word, which literally means belonging to the Lord. That's what the word church means, belonging to the Lord. In our English, our English use of the word. That's where it comes from. Kirikon, a mixture of kiros, Christ, and belonging to. Belonging to Christ. Now, I do not realistically know of any faithful Christian or any faithful preacher who has ever preached or who has ever been inclined to preach that the church is just the building. I don't know a single one. And yet we keep uttering that statement, it's not the building, it's the people. But in all honesty, in your memory, have you ever heard any faithful Christian or preacher say, it is the building? I can't think of a single one. I think this comes from a misconception that we draw that conclusion, but no one's actually saying it. It's a misconception based on our language. We make the statements, I am going to church. We say that all the time. Let's get ready for church. We got to go to church. Right? And in our minds, we picture somebody attending a building. And then we feel like we have to come to the defense of what the church is based on a misconception in language. Our own misconceptions. And a misconception in teaching. But has anyone actually heard a faithful preacher or Christian teach that very thing? I've never heard the claim. So it could be that one of the very reasons we abuse the church is out of a misconception from our own language. But again, I challenge you. Has anyone actually argued that it's the building and not the people? And so people get disgruntled with the church over this misconception that again who's teaching this this is a misconception of language not of doctrine but the word itself means belonging to the lord the church belongs to the lord it is a particular people but even though we proclaim that the church is not the building as in floor 
walls, roof. The church is a building. And the scriptures make that clear. The church is a building. And it is Jesus who is building it. Now, we're using the words of Scripture. We can't ignore the words that are used in the pages of Scripture where the church is described as a spiritual building. Where it's not made up of brick and stone of wood and drywall, but it's made up of the people and has the foundation and the people play a specific role in the church. It is a spiritual building. And this is something we'll see throughout the study, by the way. Everyone has a part. Everyone is obligated to play their part. If you are in Christ, you are under the obligation to play your part. Like in reference to the body, the wall must be the wall. The wall cannot be the roof. So everyone plays a critical role for this building. This is why neglecting the gathering neglecting the ecclesia is a very heinous sin you are not fulfilling your role you are not fulfilling your calling you are not fulfilling your christian duty this is not up for debates this is the truth of god's word first peter 2 5 1 through 9 look at look at the words that peter uses to describe the gathering he says you also as living stones here's that building language as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumbled because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they are also appointed." But you are a chosen a race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Now, there are multiple sermons in those verses I just covered. But highlighting certain things, you have to recognize that language is that there's this spiritual house that is being built. Who's the builder? God is. Christ says, I will build my church. Here we got Peter using this, this spiritual house. He's building a spiritual house. And we are called a royal priesthood. Did you know you're a priest? Did you know that? He's talking about the church here. Yeah, that's another sermon for another day, but by the way, uh, for, uh, but you just know, every believer is a priest. And we are told right here that we are a royal priesthood. That we are a chosen nation. And that we are the people of God's own possession. That is one of the distinguishing marks of the true church. They belong to God. The true church are those who belong to God, and the church itself is being built by God. Now, last week we talked about the visible church and the invisible church. I got to make something clear. We're not describing two separate churches. There is only one church. But out of that one church, we have these local assemblies, and that is that, that, that physical assembling together that we see, and that's visible to us. However, there are people within the midst of those physical gatherings, of those local assemblies, who do not belong to the true church. There are unsaved people who sit in the pews. You are not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ because you joined a local church. That's not what makes you a believer. We are united to Christ by faith, and as a result of that unity in Christ, the adoption in Christ, there is this inward sensation we are compelled by the Holy Spirit and by the truth of the Word of God to join a local church. That is one of the first fruits of salvation. 
a sensation to learn God's word, to be amongst God's people. You want to know where somebody is at in their walk? You want to know where somebody's at in their faith with Christ? Look at their attitude towards the church. Look at their attitude and their behavior towards the church. I can tell you where they're at spiritually. Their attitude towards the church will be revealing of their spiritual condition and their walk. Not absolute, but it will be telling. So while there are local gatherings that can physically that where we can physically see the church, it's only made up of those, the true church, the one true church is only made up of those who have authentic faith, or better stated, those who are redeemed. Only those who have been born again are part of the one true church, and only those who have been redeemed are proper candidates for local church membership. Now that doesn't mean somebody can't fool us. They know the teachings, they know the language, they know the lingo, they know how to act. They can most definitely trick us into making us think that they are a fellow believer. But just because they fool us doesn't mean they fool God. There's only one true church. And within a local gathering, there's still only one true church inside this local gathering. Inside this very sanctuary, there's only one true church. And it's made up of those who are redeemed. If you are redeemed, you are a member of that one true church. You are united to Christ by faith. That is what marks the true church. Those who have been united to Christ by faith. But that actually means something. Being united to Christ by faith actually means something. Not only if I'm united to Christ by faith, and you're united to Christ by faith, then we are united together. That's how the church body works. That is how adoption works. Because we have been united to Christ, we are now spiritually united, and we are called to assemble together. You understand that this is a command, not a suggestion? Hebrews 10, verse 25. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Do not forsake the assembling. In fact, as the times draw nearer to the return, get closer together, draw more together, come together more. So, we are united together. Why is this important? Because we're here for each other's spiritual edification. Everybody offers something. Everybody offers something. It's not that we gather together just so we can be spiritually edified by the pastor and him alone. No, we actually get spiritually edified by each other. Everybody has an area of strength and is being edifying for somebody else. We all bring something to the table. We are all there for each other. So everyone plays a different role. You may not know where that strength is at. You may not know everything. You may not even know what your, what your spiritual strength is that you are bringing to the table. But you bring something to the table whether you know it or not and whether you like it or not. Our ignorance can be spiritually edifying in a way. We're just speaking thoughtlessly and it's working in someone and we have no clue. And then we walk out these doors going like, man, I wish I could do something good with my life and say those right words. We'll never know. And so like I stated earlier, the walls cannot be the roof. Just like the hand cannot be the foot. If we had hands on our feet, that would be the most disgusting thing ever. I'm just thinking about food again, but far too often in our local gatherings, we have, we have somebody who wants to be something that they're not. You may not know your actual role in ministry as far as what your strength is, but you are imparting spiritual edification on somebody. You are. 
And you may not know where that role is, but God knows what your role is, and he will use you for that role. It is not an option for the faithful believer, the one professing faith in Christ. It is not an option for you to neglect the church, therefore neglecting someone else's spiritual edification. When we separate ourselves from local gatherings, it is like we're removing a part of the roof or we're removing a part of the walls. And when we start doing that, it, it, the building begins to look ugly. And God has given us an image of what that looks like just within our own physical bodies, in real time, the human anatomy. You can look at certain health things or do certain things. In Scripture, we're not just called the building, we're called the body. And it uses the same language to describe what I'm talking about. So the hand can't be the foot. But also, think about this. What if I take a rope and I wrap my wrist up really tight, block off all circulation of my hand? I've isolated my hand from my body without cutting it off, but I've done it in that way, and I decide that's the way it's going to be from now on. How long is my hand going to continue to function? How healthy will my hand be? Now let's say I cut it off completely, which is the choice of so many who profess faith in Christ. Let's just say I cut it off completely. Does that hand continue to be healthy and thriving? It is not good to separate from the body. Our Lord knows this, which is why he gives the command. It is not good for your health. It's not good for the care of the church. It is not good. It is not good for the hand to decide, you know what? I'm better off detached. And I bet I can have a better walk separated from the body. It's foolishness. This was never the understanding of the ecclesia in the early church. They knew better. And they did it under persecution. We got comfort and we don't like it, thinking we're better off. Ignorant and arrogant. It will wither and die. You will wither and die. And that's what so many people are doing to themselves spiritually thinking that they're better off. That is a lie from Satan himself. It is satanic. That can only come from satanic influence. If the scriptures gives us the command, never forsake the assembly, and in Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter 10, it's not ecclesia. It's episynagogon, where we get the word synagogue. And that means a physical gathering. Yeah, that actually is the building. It's not describing the physical building. It's describing the physical, visible unity of the people. Not an invisible unity where you're at home eating potato chips and you're going like, you know what? I'm still spiritually united in my own way. Shame on us. Never forsake the assembly, coming together visibly. So if that is a command from Scripture, what is the opposite? What does the opposite have to say? It's satanic. Never forsake the assembly. Historically, we have called this the assembly of the saints. That's a proper title. Ecclesia Hagios. The assembly of the saints. And there's another abused word, saint. We believe that the word saint, at least it's common for us to believe in our culture, that the word saint is reserved for those who are dead. And in some Protestant circles, we believe that the word saint is a strictly Catholic word. It's not. It's a biblical word. And it's a word to describe believers. Not dead believers. Living believers as well. Now, I'm going to throw off uh, some scripture at you guys. So if you need to take notes, if this is where you like to take notes, I say get it ready now. 
because I'm going to be going through them pretty quick. So, let's look at the way Paul gives his greetings. His greetings and salutations. In Romans chapter 1, verse 7, he says this, To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. These are living people. These are members of the church of Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. He calls the Corinthian church saints. They're living, they're not dead. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, same church, different letter. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is in Corinth, with all the saints who are throughout Achaia. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. These are living people speaking to the church. Colossians chapter 1, verse 2. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are the, in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. I'm just naming a few. That word saint is mentioned to those who are living and they are mentioned to those who are believers. Every true believer, truly redeemed person, every true church member is called a saint. If you are truly born again, you are called a saint. We are the assembly of the saints, the communion of saints. We think that this word means that you've achieved absolute perfect, perfection, but the, the Corinthian church is one of the worst churches in the New Testament. And Paul still addresses them as saints. Now the word saint comes from the word holy. The two are always connected. And I'll point that out here later. But in, if you want to get technical what it means, it means those who have been set apart. That's what holy means. Set apart, set aside. We are the ones who are set apart. And these words go back and should have caused us to reflect back on the sovereignty of God and salvation as the set apart ones. Because that's what it means. We are set apart by God. Remember what Jesus told Peter. This is not flesh and blood. This has not been revealed to you by flesh and blood. But this was a gift from God who is in heaven. And Jesus says, he, he says, I will build my church. We are the set apart ones. That word saint is connected to the word sanctification. Makes sense, right? Which is the lifelong process of being transformed into the image of Jesus. And it's in the process of becoming holy. We are, we are living out our sanctifying walk Every single day. When I close this in prayer, I pray that God continues his sanctifying work within you all. And that comes from that word saint. These words go together. And it's a description of the church. Therefore, we are the communion of saints. Again, the Greek word for saint is hagios. It's always connected to the Greek word holy, which is often called often hagion. You see the difference? You hear the difference? Or you hear the, the similarity? The two words are connected, and they both mean the same thing set apart. Now, let's remember what we read from Peter earlier today. We, we've already read from this in Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, or set apart nation, a people for God's own possession. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. We are the communion of saints and we are a holy communion. This is what Peter's saying. A holy nation, a people of God's own possession, a holy communion. There's much more to be said about the church. We're not done with this study. As a matter of fact, we're going to continue to expand on what has been said here today as what we've discussed here today. 
But considering the things that we have covered here today, and hopefully your appreciation for the communion of saints has grown a little bit, Hopefully it's increased a little bit. Hopefully uh, uh, you, you've gained a little bit of knowledge here today, just a bit. But here's the thought I want to leave us with. What we have learned today is that Christ is the one who will build his church. And that is the true church, the, the, the spiritual people of God. It is God who brings the increase. We understand this. This is... It is God who brings the increase. But this is not our idea of the modern day church. Our, our idea of the modern day church is how can we bring the increase? The church cannot be burdened by numerical growth. We're always happy to see the church grow numerically. We always want to see the church grow numerically. But the burden of that growth is not our burden. However, there is a burden of growth that the church is obligated to have. Now today we've scratched the surface of what the church is. There's still a lot more to be said. But the one thing that we did make clear here today is that the church, that is the true church, are only those who are united to Christ by faith. And because we have been united to Christ by faith, we have been united to each other. That is a non-negotiable. You love the Lord. You believe the Lord. You believe he took your sins for you on the cross and that he was resurrected and that you will be in heaven with him the day you die. This is a non-negotiable. You are united to other people who share the same faith. There is unity in the body. And we must be united in this body. And it's in light of that truth we look at the true burden of growth for the church. Because again, the burden of numerical growth is not on us. It is God who will bring the increase. Putting that burden on God's people to cause numerical growth, that is a 20th century idea that must be abandoned. It has crippled us. This is why I could confidently say that there are churches out there that should not have that title. But the growth that we must burden ourselves with is the growth in unity and the growth in holiness. And that is the only growth we need to concern ourselves with. What do we want to do? Do we want to flood this place with the walking dead? Give the walking dead the responsibilities, making them members, have them have a say in spiritual activities, have them have a say in spiritual truth? Is that what we want? In other words, do we want a dead church? Because we can make that happen real quick. But our small gathering must have the burden of being united together and have the burden for growth in unity and in holiness. For this is pleasing to our Lord. And if you sit here redeemed, knowing the cost of your redemption, then pleasing our Lord is a reasonable response and it should be the desire of our hearts Every, singing, every single waking moment to grow in holiness, to grow in unity, and we will trust God to bring the increase. Those gimmicks, they're great at drawing people in. But those ministries will not take solid stands anywhere. And when they don't, we see it. Very talented and educated businessmen, very talented motivational speakers. But let's start doing the hard work, and then we'll see where they go. It's Pride Month. How many ministries are actively speaking against it? How many? 
No, we go quiet. We don't want to rattle those cages. I thought yesterday that they were going to make me mark out the Planned Parenthood on 41st. Because I noticed that, that all of a sudden I'm in that area. I was fully prepared to tell them I will not do it. Luckily, I didn't have to, so I didn't have to create that awkward conversation. I'm still in that area, though, for right now. And they're doing road work right there. That time comes, I will not do it, and I will tell them exactly why I will not do it. They will not get a single ounce of labor from me. And if they go, well, let's talk about this, I'm going to tell them, there's no discussion here. I'm letting you know this will not happen. I'm not afraid of what some people may think of me. I'm concerned about what God would think of me. And I will not give a single ounce of helping that place stay in business. Hit their communication lines. <laughs> I'm not going to be sad. Hit their gas lines. I hope the place goes up. No one hurt, but I hope the place goes up. I'm not going to be sorry for having a biblical stance on marriage. And I'm not going to be silent about it either. I'm not going to be sorry and I'm not going to be silent on having a biblical stance on personhood. Defending the most innocent among us. But you try to get some other ministries involved in that. And they don't know you. And I've heard it. It's been said to me directly. You're getting a bit political there, aren't you? No, nah, sir, this is biblical. They hijacked it and called it political. They are the ones that are using that language. Not me. We're afraid. But man, they can fill up some buildings, though, can't they? I'd rather be strong four people than a dead and weak 400 people. And I'd pick that any day of the week. And it's not like I'm the strongest there's ever been or I'm even the strongest among us. But it's my, it's my Savior who is strong and gives me strength. And there's more to talk about this. There's more to be said about the church and w behind what I'm saying right now. The point is, the reasonable response from us is to desire growth and unity with each other. And when I say each other, I mean the true church and grow in holiness. And that should be our desire of our hearts every waking moment. Let's pray. Well, Father God, I am thankful uh, for today's message, Lord, and that we get to unpack uh, the true teaching of your church. And Lord, we are just beginning, but I'm already encouraged and excited. I pray that we're all led to great conviction here today, and there's still so much to learn, Lord, but I pray that it just gives us a, a taste and a desire for what's next. Help us love each other more, Lord. Help us to grow in holiness more and lead us in the direction that we must go. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.